organizers pitched this to me as an idea, I took a very deep breath and thought, I'll give it a go. And the way that I want to do this, I want to uh, start by showing you a video, which is, uh, will probably make a lot of sense after we've actually just watched it together. So let's just watch this video for one minute, and then we're going to recap on it. Tokenoma. Always spelled how it sounds. T-O-K-O-N-O-M-A. Tokenoma. Arvind, that is correct, and since you are the only speller remaining in round 15, if you spell correctly this next word, you will be declared the 2013 Scripps National Spelling Bee Champion. <laughs> this is okay. No pressure. Enough applause. <laughs> Give me the word. Woo. Canadal. Canadal. May I have the language of fortune, please? German-derived Yiddish. <laughs> no way. Now be careful here. May I have the definition, Look at his please? Expression. Canadal or knadel is a small mass of leavened dough cooked by boiling or steaming, as with soup, stew, or fruit, with which it is to be served. It's a dumpling. As in, the back. Max hoped to find at least one more canadal in his soup bowl but all he discovered was his missing lower denture. <laughs> <laughs> canadal. Uh, are there any alternate pronunciations? There's just canadal and knadal. Canadal. K N A I D E L. Canadal. And on that note, you'll see that uh, <laughs> from the spelling bee, I want to take that as an anchor, really, actually, to describe to you some attributes which I want to share with you what I think really actually some of the young minds that are growing up today really actually need. There's a lot in that spelling bee and that championship uh, face of that young man there and what he was doing, which we've actually learnt about in the last two days. To frame that, what I want to do is I want to show you the cover of the May edition of Time magazine. It's a fantastic edition. As you can see in front of it, it's the me, me, me generation, as it's described there. And in this article, uh, Joel Stein puts forward the premise that our current generation, who we work with, and as an educator myself, I've had 16 years of working with young people, where we sometimes have the hypothesis that the current generation we work with are the most self-centered, narcissistic generation. All they do is want to take endless selfies of themselves, as is demonstrated in this, in this article here. And that's the premise of Stein's article. However, I'm here today to say to you that that is insidious, it's completely false, and it's corrupt. Anyone who works with young people knows that what Stein is putting forward is completely false. Those of you who are fans of The Atlantic magazine might have also picked up that there was a critique of Stein's article that was put forward in Time magazine. And Stein said that if we critically look at the cover of some of the top magazines since the 1960s, we see the following pattern. It, Life magazine said that there was the generation gap in the mid-60s. The New Yorker said that they were the me generation in the 1970s. The Washington Monthly also put forward that we had a disconnected generation in the 1980s. Newsweek said that there were the video generation. This was the emergence of the Atari. And if you're old enough to remember an Atari, congratulations. And that was in 1985. Time magazine said there was the something, the 20-something generation. And also we see this occurring again in the mid-90s. Time magazine, though, also put forward It's All About Me in 2007. And very soon after that, bang, there's the cover shown yet again. So what I want to do is really actually to say to you, when you read these articles about the me, me, me generation, I think take it with a grain of salt. 
Some really interesting research that's come out quite recently, though, and really topical in relationship to what we learnt yesterday from Mark Prensky, has come out of the Pew Institute from Harvard, which talks about the use of social media by young people. And what we can see from 2006 to 2012 in this data is that young people are using uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so forth in a different way and also with greater frequency. We can also, in that report, learn quite a lot about the way that boys and girls are using this material differently. We're in the generation of where we're able to measure nearly everything. And in this instance, for example, we also have, through the Gallup organisation, a daily happiness meter. And if you follow Twitter, there's also Twitter accounts where we can actually understand the whole pop moods of populations. So I think one of the big challenges that's going to be facing young people who are coming up in our next generation, and after all, we'll be solving many of the problems of the digital natives that are emerging, are going to be linked with how they understand and use data uh, in an informed way. So I don't think that this current generation at all are throwing the world into the wastebasket. In fact, I see no evidence of that. Today has been a fantastic example when we've listened to the young minds speaking of the entrepreneurship, the innovation that young people can show. But I want to say this, and this is the whole claim of my presentation this afternoon. I want to say to you that character is development is just as important as intellect. This flies in the face of the majority of the propositions that you will read in contemporary media, where NAPLAN is the measure of all things, where my schools will measure all things. But I don't believe that that is true. I believe that character development is as important as intellect, and it's not an either-or dichotomy. I think the other thing that we need to actually understand for young people is that they need to appreciate the whole spectrum of the mental health um, uh, proposition. So, for example, we have the right-hand side of this spectrum, which is about flourishing, which is about well-being and positive emotion. I want young people to really understand and be equipped with the tools that they know how to take themselves from showing no symptoms in well-being or being okay to actually flourishing. I want young people in schools not only just to visit the school psychologist because they are experiencing challenges of anxiety or depression, I want them to see the school psychologist in schools so that they had the conversation to say, hey, how can you give me the tools so that I can go from being okay to being really good? Because psychologists also had those tools, but we don't see that happening in schools as much as we ought to. I want to do this by giving you an insight into the area of positive psychology. I've been really fortunate in the last six years to work in this area and bring positive psychology and well-being projects to scale across a number of schools. Professor Lee Waters from the University of Melbourne, who's one of my colleagues, has also done a really fantastic review of this whole area. Positive psychology is the science of studying what goes right with you in life. It's the scientific study of equipping you with tools so that you can have an impact and you know how to monitor and look after yourself when things don't go well. Positive psychology is not a silver bullet, though. It won't solve all of the issues in the world. It won't solve poverty. It won't solve uh, the crisis in the World Bank. But what it will do is it will provide you with skills that will enable you to be able to live a more fulfilling and richer life. In the last five years, we've seen a disproportionate move of this into positive education, as it's called. My favourite definition is the third one down there, which is uh, by, Lindsay Gre by Lindsay Green and uh, Susie Odes as well, which is that positive psychology is the application of positive psychology principles in education. So I want to now move into what are the key skills that I think that the minds of tomorrow are going to need. The first one I've borrowed and stolen from a very wise group of Greeks. In the classical world, to understand oneself or to know thyself was one of the core maximums of the Delphic Oracle. And we've read about it endlessly. I teach English literature. And in my classes, I get to talk about these core concepts of knowing oneself. When you have excessive hubris or pride as a character in literature. And the great thing is being able to connect literature with the character strengths of young people. But I think it's absolutely critical that young people have the skills to be able to understand and to know themselves. That's the first premise. The second thing that I really think that young people do need to be aware of is that they need to be aware of the risks factors for depression amongst their peers and being able to capture them. 
because we know from the work of the CS, Young and Well and CRC unit under Jane Burns that young people are very good at looking after each other. They will stick with their mates and they'll be able to recognize when that one in five are struggling. But we also need to equip young people so they're not like ambulances at the bottom of a cliff waiting for something to happen and then intervene. We need to equip them with usable skills and usable skills that stick so that they're proactive in their mental health. One way of going about it is to take a classical philosophy and put it into modern science. The work of Professor Martin Seligman argues that well-being falls under five broad buckets, and he describes this as his PERMA principle. And that, that is that we need to have an increase in positive emotion in our life, that we need to have greater levels of engagement, that we need to have greater levels of relationship, meaning, and accomplishment. And so what I'm proposing to you is that young people need to be brought up in an environment where they are consciously stimulated amongst these four to five different buckets, that we need to look at how can we restructure and realign our school systems so that they are actually aware of the significance of these. Because when they're combined, they lead to a state of flourishing. This is like a dashboard, and this is the dashboard of a car. And so what Seligman argues, and it's something that I think every child should know, is that well-being is not made up of any one dashboard on the car. It's looking down, and when you know when something's going wrong with your car, it's not just going to be the fuel tank. It's going to be actually indicated by the oil. It's going to be indicated by the accelerator and various different factors. So what we need to do is that we need to educate young people to understand that well-being is like a dashboard that there are multiple factors, that they need to be able to become nuanced in being able to read and understand the differences between their engagement, their relationships, their meaning and accomplishment, and how they can turn up the dial on different aspects of it as well. At St. Peter's College Adelaide, where I work, we've done this. We've measured it. And we've actually started to teach students about PERMA and the skills that they're able to acquire so that they can actually engage in these skills before they need it. The premise is that we are teaching these skills to these young people before they actually require it. How many of you in this room have taken a course of penicillin? Can you just put your hand up for me? It's a really interesting question. Just cast your eye around. Nearly every single person in this room has taken a course of penicillin. Penicillin was developed by an old scholar of St. Peter's College, Lord Florey. And so what's really exciting in what we're doing at the moment at Saints is that we're looking at how can we actually buffer young men, because we're an all-boys school, against well-being and the crisis or anxiety of well-being going to ill-being before they need it. Amongst that population will be another Howard Florey. Stay tuned. So what we've done is we've measured well-being, and this has changed the language at the school. We've actually had measured a whole raft of things. I took great delight in meeting Professor Dweck yesterday. She's one of my great heroes. And we actually measured the growth and the fixed mindset of our students and also our faculty at the school. And what this has done is it's enabled us to have conversations that weren't there before. We've made what's invisible visible, in the words of John Hattie. So I think that one of the other core principles, other than character is as important as intellect, is that we need to systematically teach young people that they can grow their mindset. In order to do that first, though, we need to teach teachers that they can grow their mindset too. Because the key to unlocking young minds of the future is to focus in particular on pre-service teacher training and getting some of these core concepts that make perfect sense to you and me into our university systems. So we need to make sure that people actually hear about Professor Dweck's concepts of fixed and growth mindset combined with effective praise so that they are equipped with these skills before they land in the playground and they're giving feedback to young people in real time. The other two things that I would really actually love in the minds for the future to really actually get their head around is actually about failure. And I noticed that this book was actually downstairs for sale in this conference. How Children Succeed looks at the intersection between grit the character strength of grit and determination, which has been the work of Professor um, Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania, and also the intersection with character strengths as developed by Marty Seligman. 
These two concepts, I believe, are really pivotal for young people to really understand. No young child should be leaving school without knowing what their strengths are, knowing that they have 24 of them, knowing them that they're a fantastic orchestra, and sometimes they need to have the trumpets blaring, and the other times they need to know when to use the triangle. And they need to be able to know that and fail at it. And that's something which I think that we're not quite doing as effectively as we could. I think that by taking these 24 character strengths, and I'll give you one concrete example. Through teaching of English literature, we have such a fantastic way in to talk about character strengths of individual people. So for example, last year I taught the great Gatsby. Perfect timing. Baz Luhrmann didn't consult us at all, but we tried, and we tried to ring him. But in looking at the great Gatsby, what we did is that we asked boys at the school to take their character strength profile, come up with their character strengths, then read the text, and then look at the intersection between what were Gatsby's character strengths, which ones were his character strengths that were shadows and got in the way, and then also we asked them afterwards to reflect on what impact that had on them. We've measured their character strengths. You'll see that at the top, the top character strengths of our young people at the school is fairness and equity, honesty, kindness, and the capacity to love and be loved. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the band of brothers is well and truly alive in all boys schools. So, to conclude, the me, me, me generation. I totally reject that statement that Klein puts forward. It fills me slightly with pessimism when I have to read it, but every day when I work with young people and I have the opportunity to come to great conferences like this, I realise that the me, me, me generation and this narrow perspective is taking it from a really, really small view, and it's not true. How do I know this? Our school captain, who you heard from yesterday, John Vrodos, who was on a panel, he invited a whole stack of school captains from around Australia, government, Catholic, independent schools, and they came to our school and he held a student leadership summit. He planned it to the nth degree with his vice captain. Two and a half days these people met and they came up with their own leadership charter based upon strengths and individuality where they had a vision, mission and goals. 2.5 days with these young people would cure the deepest cynic about the me, me, me generation. These young people were passionate, they were ready to enact change, and they were ready to lead. They were so encaptured in what they were doing, they were able to invite Matt Cowdery, who spoke this morning, who has character and intellect in spades, and he spoke to them for an hour and a half on the Saturday night. They also had the governor of South Australia come and talk to each one of these leaders individually. So, ladies and gentlemen, at the, just to conclude, what I want to say to you is that character is just as important as intellect. We need to give young people the tools to be able to understand that, and please don't share the unthinking scepticism towards young people because it doesn't exist. Thank you.